this is an amazing site. Thanks. I'm loving some of these rain screen details and the open gap siding is incredible. Can you tell us maybe just a little bit about the siding, what you've got going on here sure. for WRB? Sure. I, I know some of it, but I'd rather hear from the guy who's actually building this. Uh, so this house is using reclaimed barn wood here uh, for the cladding, as you can see. And then we have a tongue and groove V-joint dug fur for our beam ends and soffit materials. And what our assembly here is, is first it's a 12 inch thick double stud wall sheathed with 5.8 zip system as our primary air and water control layer. And that's behind here. So we can't see it right now, but if you were to peel this WRB up, this Invisirap, uh, behind there is tape zip system. On top of that, we have the Invisirap because this cladding, unless we were to back up every single one of these joints with something, is an open joint cladding. So that means that this WRB or whatever's behind it has to withstand UV exposure. And Zip is not rated for that. Very few products are rated for that. So what we did is we did the Invisirap for the UV protection, the barn wood nailed with stainless ring shanks. And then you'll see that the guys, the carpenters, as they're going through take and they rattle can each one of the rain screen gaps here so that you're not seeing that bright shiny bare wood showing through in that open joint at each one of these rain screen gaps. The reason for two, and this is a common question is, is it so that we have the vertical orientation because if we run our rain screens vertically over top of our framing, we can't put vertical wood on these because they're only every 16 inches and we don't have 17 inch wide material to work with. Hard to come by. It's kind of hard to come by. I really like what you've got going on here. Um, you know, the rain screen, obviously you've got a full three quarter here, really is closer to inch and a half because, you know, every 16 inches you've got that full space. So mm -hmm. basically unlimited venting and drying potential yeah. and really hard to see, but I love the clean line you got going on where the barn board meets the soffit. Mm -hmm. Just, you're gonna let all that water uh, or excuse me, not water, all that air in here to pull any moisture out of the backside of this wood, you gotta have a place for it to escape. So that half inch channel across the top, yeah. where so this essentially vents, so, so, so to explain a little bit more for everybody, if you're watching this, what we will have at the bottom of the wall here, which isn't present yet, is a core vent closure at the bottom of the wall to allow air in. And then we have core vent up at the top. And the detail that Aaron's talking about at the soffit there is, is we put that core vent in and then we hold the siding down a half inch from the soffit. And that's our exit, our exhaust of the rain screen ventilation gap. Though it's not super critical here because this thing is open joint and it has so much capacity to just move air through it. But we want to try and have those closures. There's other areas on this house where we don't have the open joint situation. So we have to have that detail for inlet and exhaust of the air behind, as well as the water out at the bottom. Uh, other quick little things here is uh, you'll see we're prepped for some services out here. Future, this will get an outdoor uh, kitchen area. All of these get detailed with a gasket back at the zip system. So there's a Roflex gasket or a Sega gasket behind here. And then they get taped just for further water control out here. And we were just talking about before we started shooting this, that I'm actually not crazy about the fact that this is taped down at the bottom of the wall here <laughs> because any moisture that can get behind this WRB here could actually get trapped. So I'm going to have the guys pull this tape off at the bottom of the wall here. So then any incidental moisture behind this WRB has a way to get out. And that's a key point because if you remember the wall assembly, this is not here for air. You've already detailed with the yeah, zip system behind there. Yeah. This is strictly for UV. Mm -hmm. So why would you want to create a situation where you can trap water? Bingo. Well, Ben has graciously decided to take me on tour of another job site and uh, mechanical attic. Mechanical attic. So this house has uh, the condition of being on ledge rock. So we couldn't uh, get a full foundation underneath this house, which means that we needed to find somewhere else for the mechanicals. Uh, and something I'm not like a huge fan of is putting big water holding appliances above living spaces. But in this house, we had no choice. So you'll see right behind us here, we do heat pump water heaters as a minimum on all of our projects. This one here is sitting in a pan and we came up with kind of a clever way to protect this for the future. So this pan actually drains into a ceiling intentionally below it. And that ceiling is the ceiling that's located over a bathtub of a guest bathroom. So in the event 
And I've never seen a hot water heater fully let go, right? They just want a slow leak over time. And there will be a water sensor in this one. If this thing were to catastrophically let go and go into the pan, it would dump into a ceiling over top of a bathtub. And at least then you're just repairing a small area and the water's draining down the bathtub. Very well thought out. I was actually very impressed with the level of detail that, or the level of thought that went into, not just we got to put it here, but if this goes wrong and this goes wrong, it's going to be okay. All right. And why do you guys do heat pump hot water heaters? Does it have anything to do with the, oh, I don't know, the amount of energy consumed yeah. by hot water? <laughs> Absolutely. So for us, it's purely an efficiency thing. You know, our specialty, our niche as a company is around performance and efficiency and environmental impact. So the way that we get a lower energy consumption is by using something like a heat pump hot water heater. This one being a hybrid system, so it still has two electric resistance elements in it, and then the heat pump compressor on the top of it. There's a few variables that go into it, but the average household electrical bill, 20% hot water alone. Mm -hmm. Moving right along, the mechanicals. Um, tell us a little bit about this, Ben. Uh, this is interesting, at yeah. least it is to me. So hopefully you as well. So we do uh, ducted heat pumps on most of our projects, right? Um, and we pride ourselves as a company on offering really good indoor air quality. So one of the parts of having really indoor, good indoor air quality is having really good filtration. And the way that you do that is by using a very high MERV filter. So uh, to do a high MERV filter, you need a really kind of like thick filter, right? See, this guy's a four inch thick filter. The thing is though, is when we do that, in combination with a heat pump, a heat pump doesn't push a lot of air. That's how it stays efficient. So in order to make sure that we don't choke the heat pump, we have to appropriately size the filter. And you can't just use like the filter that is the same size as your HVAC air handler. Aaron, you weren't an HVAC guy. <laughs> so what we do is we go through a process where we check the face velocity of the filter to make sure that we're not choking the air handler. Because what can happen is if we do it in the summertime, these things will ice up and you'll start making ice instead of air conditioning. Well, on the other job, the reason I asked about this so much and I wanted to capture it here is typically a lot of our ducted heat pumps, there may be like a MERV 10 or maybe MERV like eight. eight. Like just for comparison, yeah. like this here is the filter slot that the manufacturer provides and that in there will accept a one inch thick filter in here. So you can see the difference in size right here, not only in height, there's also way more depth behind us that we're not capturing on camera and thickness, one inch versus four inches. And what that does is it gives us way more surface area on each of these pleats so that we get less resistance to airflow. You know, these are the type of filters that we're gonna monitor them uh, with some monitoring tools that we use, some of the OmniSense, and we're gonna watch static pressure across these. These filters may only need to be replaced once every one to two years and still provide really incredible ventilation uh, air cleaning. Another little thing that we do with these is these heat pumps, these Mitsubishi ducted units, we set these to run continuously. So they'll run at about 15% speed, 24 hours a day. And what that does is that makes all of the air in the house being continually turned over and scrubbed so that you have really nice clean air in the house. Anyways, while the camera's rolling, I'm going to actually attempt to reinstall this. Are you licensed for that? <laughs> no, I am not licensed for that. And I actually wish that I had not pulled this out now, but. Yeah, it's got a little series of tracks in there. There we go. Ta-da. There we go. Yeah. Beauteous. <coughs> Goes in. Well, I know what this is. Whole house dehumidification. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think, or well, I know why, but maybe you should tell some of our viewers why it's really important to add. Uh, especially in a high performance build. Yeah, so uh, originally when we started doing high performance builds, we had this romantic idea that we're gonna have like one little heat pump and it was gonna do all the magical things in the house. Well, we started to learn lessons over the decade. Uh, and one of the things that we learned is, is because of uh, the way we air seal and insulate our buildings, we end up making our shoulder seasons longer is effectively what happens. So those times when we only need a little bit of conditioning throughout the day are longer. What that leads to is an opportunity for high humidity in the house. Because the system's not running, the coils aren't getting cold, and we're not dehumidifying and dealing with that latent load in the house, the humidity level goes up, but the house is still at the right temperature. 
So we have figured out that we need to do ducted dehumidification even in areas up here in the north. So this right here, our general strategy is, is that we're going to try and pick it up from somewhere high in the building. That's where most of your humidity is going to sit, right? It rides on the warm air up to high in the building. We pull it from high in the building and then we distribute it back through our HVAC system. Yeah. And it's, I know there's people who think that, oh, my ERV is going to take care of it. No. The ERV can actually do the opposite. It can do the opposite. Yeah. But if you're, you know, 60, 70 percent humidity outdoors and you're sucking that in, you're filtering it. And to a certain level, you're going to dehumidify it. But it's just not going to be able to keep up the same way that this unit. But it, but it may it. not even dehumidify it. it in the, summer, it in the summertime, yeah. it's actually going to ratchet your humidity up potentially in the house. And in the wintertime, it does the opposite. So we do ducted dehumidification. And now we do humidification yeah. in all of our houses. Because what we saw is, is you know, the mm. ERV only captures a percentage. It's a latent yeah. percentage of capture efficiency mm. that it has. And what happens is in the wintertime, when it's really dry outside and that ERV is running, is we watch the humidity just go click click, 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 click down in the house, and we have to add humidity. So it's the same thing. It's that gap between uh, the latent capture efficiency and the conditions inside out of the house that causes the humidity either to be forced to rise or forced to lower. This is a great example of where we're all experts at where we build, and adding humidity is something I never think about. Yeah. Never think about it because, you know, our average relative humidity is 69%. Like, we're always... But that's out outdoors. That's outdoors. That's outdoors. That's, outdoors. outdoors. that's only relative, it, right, it, to it the temperature relative. that's outdoors. It, it gets cold where you live, doesn't it? It, it does. But yeah. even, even without uh, having humidification, uh, just like monitor... Now, granted, limited to monitoring my own home, Yeah. Um, we don't dip below 40 yeah, and that's is sometimes is the case in older homes because they have a lot of other moisture sources. Or if you live in a smaller house, like I, my yeah. wife and son and I live in 900 square feet, so just our daily living puts a lot of moisture into the air in a small volume. But like often we'll see in larger houses around us, like the ones we build for our clients, where if they don't have humidification, they're going to see temperatures or humidities dropping down into the teens. Yeah. And that starts to get uncomfortable. You start getting static shocks. You start getting nosebleeds in the house. And nobody wants that. We want comfort. As and part problems of what we're with your finishes. Absolutely. <laughs> Hardwood yeah. floors don't like <laughs> to go from 50% down to 12%. No, not at all. Because at 12%, they're like 4% wood moisture content. Everything's yeah. popping and cracking and not a pretty picture. Okay, I think we have covered the realm of dehumidification. Do it. Here, here. I, but I'll throw a couple of <laughs> quick little points to you here, some tips and tricks with these. So these, these are the Santa Fe hang kits that you can get right from Santa Fe. They're easy. It's a little ratchet closure system. Something you need to know about installing ducted dehumidifiers that often gets missed is, is we have vibration isolation, two pieces of flex right here in our duct room. The thing that can happen is, is when these things start up, it's like a refrigerator motor compressor in there. They can vibrate, and if you do rigid metal duct work, which you should be doing, then they will vibrate the rigid metal duct work, and you can transmit that noise through the house. So not just dehues, but any of our mechanical equipment. We do a piece of flex somewhere between the rigid metal duct cork and the unit, and somewhere between the duct work and the termination, the vent, the register in the rooms, we put a piece of flex so that we're isolating that vibration from the mechanical components here from transmitting into the livable space. So this is something that we've been having a lot of conversations about uh, in-house at Big Dog Construction lately, and that's makeup air. Mm -hmm. And it's important because, well, we're building more, tighter and tighter houses, and when we add something like a rain hood that's sucking 600, 800 CFM, that air has to come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And if we have a submarine, not that we're building submarines, but that's what the ultimate goal is, uh, there's no place for that air to come from. So we want to be able to open our doors and things like that. We don't want to suck the water out of the toilet bowl. We need this. Mm -hmm. And e even for things like clothes dryers, uh, you know, a typical clothes dryer pulls 400 CFM worth of air. And if you don't have the ability, you don't have the natural leakage in the house, your clothes are going to take longer to dry. So this here is this is uh, one of two types of systems that we use. This is an electro industry. The other one we use is a Fantech makeup air system. Um, and what this does is it has an 
outdoor air supply that comes in, a motorized damper, a filter, and a preheater, and then a control system. So whenever we turn something on, like a range hood, or we turn on something like a clothes dryer that's venting and trying to pull air out of the house, this thing will sense it through a, sense, a set of current sensing relays, terminals around the circuit, and it will open up this motorized damper and start to bring air in from the outside. If that air is cold, it's going to start to warm that air up, and then we're going to deliver it into the house. Uh, this house, uh, we're doing uh, kind of a, my favorite approach for uh, delivering this makeup air. So this is going to deliver to the toe kicks of where the range is. So you'll stand in the kitchen at the cooking appliance and the air will come down through the wall and out at your toes. And then it washes up over the range and it pulls all of the cooking, you know, effluent gases, particles into the airstream and out through that range hood. And that range hood is actually right behind me here on this remote blower. That's one of my favorite methods for, you know, deliver the makeup air close to where you're going to be needing the makeup yeah. air. Deliver it at the appliance. That way you sort of have, for lack of a better term, a contained column. And you don't have, you know, that feeling of a draft coming from another room or mm -hmm. another place. And also if you're actively moving and doing something like cooking, you're not as likely to notice that, you know, uh, moving air in that space at that time. Yeah. For us, we're trying to leverage a phenomenon that's called entrainment. So when you have a moving air sheet, it's going to pull in air around that moving air sheet. So we're trying to do that and get the physics of the air movement to pull all of those cooking gases off of the top of the appliance and into the hood. This is why I like hanging out with Ben. I understand what I'm talking about, but he knows the name of what I'm talking about. <laughs> Mark Rosenbaum told me something years ago that was funny. And he's like, you know why I get to charge so much money for consulting? And I'm like, why is that, Mark? And he says, because I know where the book is. And the point to that is, is all of this stuff was figured out maybe in the 20s or 30s. Absolutely. And you just got to go out and go to your library and pull out some books and read about it. And there it is. Oh, they knew about this shit a long time ago. It, yeah, there is really nothing brand new that we're doing in the high performance world. It has been around either in the 20s, 20s through the 50s, somebody was doing it. Mm -hmm. Definitely people were doing it in the 70s. Um, it just, we're, we're actually starting to add some more modern things to what we're doing, like makeup air with, you know, electric dampers. That probably wasn't readily available in the 50s, but now we can buy it. Mm -hmm. so.